Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Blessed be his kingdom now and forever. Amen. Good morning and welcome to St. Matthias Episcopal Church. I'm Father Scott Harding. On behalf of myself and the Vestry, we're happy to have you here worshiping with us this 11th Sunday after the Feast of Pentecost. Um, just a couple of announcements. Know that we are uh, worshiping uh, once again in person on Sunday mornings. Also, you can live stream that on Facebook if you'd prefer. Also, these sermons um, that you hear here um, can be uh, listened to in podcast form. If you go to our website at www.tacoachurch.com, you can go to the sermons and sign up for those podcasts and you can hear the sermons in audio form as well. Also, we're uh, returning back to in-person uh, Wednesday morning prayer worship at 7.30, so we do invite you to the parish hall for that, and are continuing uh, our Zoom Compline services at 7.30 p.m., so you can join us on Zoom at 7.30 p.m. Uh, for Compline on Wednesdays also. Uh, let's continue our worship by singing together the Gloria, uh, hymn S280, also found on page 356 of the Book of Common Prayer. be with you. Let us pray. Grant to us, Lord, we pray, the spirit to think and do always those things that are right, that we who cannot exist without you may by you be enabled to live according to your will. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the Gospel according to John. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. The Jews began to complain about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They were saying, Is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he now say, I have come down from heaven? Jesus answered them, Do not complain among yourselves. No one can come to me unless drawn by the Father who sent me, and I will raise that person up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father except the one who is from God. He has seen the Father. Very truly I tell you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven, so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that come, came down from heaven. Whoever eats of this bread will live forever, and the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. 
In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So, we come today to the um, sort of our, our third week of talking about Jesus uh, being the, the bread of life, being um, feeding feeding the five thousand, and and bringing the people into into a knowledge of of God's grace and God's God's sustenance and God's providence and and the reality that that Jesus is the true bread which has come down from heaven which he says today he is the one who is going to deliver us from from sin and from bondage um, much like the exodus in the old testament that Moses led uh, the people of Israel out of Egypt into the land of promise so Jesus um, is is going to be the one to to deliver Israel and ultimately the world um, from sin and death, and um, through his his death on the cross and his resurrection. And so we're we're in this in the midst of this this narrative, um, as we said last week, not unlike the the narrative of the of the woman at the well, where there's sort of a, a, a back and forth of of how can this be. And today, we sort of begin with the religious leaders saying, um, "Isn't this isn't this Jesus? Don't we know him, the son of Joseph? We we know these people. How can he say uh, I, he's come down from heaven?" Um, right, and they begin to grumble. And Jesus says, "Don't grumble among yourselves, right? Um, no one can uh, can come to me unless the Father who draws them to me, and I'll raise them up on the last day." Oh, and, and it sort of goes back and forth. And then, as we said last week, remember last week where we had, um, well, our fathers ate the bread that came um, from heaven that Moses gave us. And Jesus said, well, Moses didn't give you that bread. The Father gave you that bread. Um, now, Jesus says, your fathers, right, sort of calling it back. They're talking about, well, our fathers did this. He's like, right, your fathers ate manna in the wilderness. And then they died. Whoever eats of this bread will never die. Um, they'll have life that that goes on forever. And it's sort of in this vein that um, already that, that I sort of want to shift to the reading from Ephesians because I think it's important um, of of what it is that that Jesus is really saying. Um, and what Jesus is really talking about is that you are, are going to become children of God. You are going to become people of God. That God will will be with always and forever and never forsake. And you will, will be filled with this new food. And, and in many ways, you'll become a new people. You become a free people. You become a people loosed from the bondage of sin and death and and be able to be filled with the Spirit of God. We don't talk about the Spirit of God right here, but this is really the this is really the ultimate point that all is being led to in in John's gospel as well. And through the scriptures, as you go through the gospels, there's there's Jesus is the Messiah, Jesus is the Word made flesh. But then Jesus um, leaving, Jesus dying, Jesus death on the cross, which which opens up the way to everlasting life, also opens the way to the Spirit of God coming to dwell in us. And this is this is what's what's so important, right? This is what he talked about with the with the woman at the well. You'll have living water in you, flowing in you and through you. Anybody who asks for this water, they'll have. And and so now we have sort of the same image with this with this bread of life that. That when it's in us, we're we're filled with God's Spirit, and and we never die. And we're not just talking about eternal life; we're talking about this new life of being a child of God. And so um, that t- that takes us to to Ephesians, which is um, so. Uh, 
an important passage today is is these these aspects of of Ephesians these these verses this week next week and maybe the week following um, of of who you are in in this new reality this new identity of being a child of God um, and really everything within this as we talked about last week where we talked about being worthy um, in Christ and um, worthy not because you've earned anything but therefore act act worthy in sort of an economic balance type word that's being used that is God has has transformed you God has made you his heir God has filled you with the spirit God has anointed you and sealed you um, and made you his own and so therefore live in this manner according to to these new promises of what it is to reflect um, the glory and promise of God. You were this way before, but now you're this way, right? I mean, you were, but now you are. And this is this is a real important um, aspect um, of of what it is to be in Christ, what it is to be a child of God, what it is. Um, you know, once upon a time, you were you were over here, and now you're over here, right? And we do this through through many phases of life. In in uh, graduation, you know, once you were you were just a high school kid, and now you are in college. Or once you you know were not old enough to drive, and now you've earned your license. And so therefore, act in this way, right? I mean, once you were single. And now you are married, so therefore live in, in a manner that that gives respect to your your spouse, right? So there's there's all of these different these different ways um, that that this passage in Ephesians sort of needs to be seen through that lens of you were this, but now this is not just a sort of lists of do's and don'ts of um, therefore having put away falsehood let each of you speak the truth with his neighbor we are members of one another be angry do not do not sin um let no thief no longer steal let him labor doing honest work with his hands that he may have something to give it to one another need this isn't just sort of this these contradictory statements though they are good things to do for society they're 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 really a part of of, of our identity of what it means to be in christ and ultimately leading up to the sort of culmination of therefore um, present yourself as a living sacrifice as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to god walk in love as christ loved us who gave himself for us an offering and sacrifice to god um, this is this is the way that, that we're called to to respond and um it's interesting because i think i watched um yet again there's a great there's a great um TED Talk by Brian Stevenson and Brian Stevenson, who is um, the lawyer, sort of the founder of the Equal Justice Initiative, and um, has come up um, in in many of the readings and, and writings when we went through the Sacred Ground class, but also um, outside of that, um, the, the movie Just Mercy is is based on on his work. Um, in in and so. But what he, he he told the story in the TED Talk about his grandmother and how his grandmother um, said you know a, a few things that she wanted that uh, she wanted him to do and one of them was was don't drink alcohol and you know upon reflection he said there's good reasons for this you know her, his grandfather was in prison during prohibition and his uncles died of alcohol related diseases um, but those words had such power. Um, that even when his brother and sister um, had snuck some beer and tried to get him to to drink some, and he said, "No, no, no," his brother says, "Don't, don't. Uh, you're not still hung up on on uh, Mama's uh, talk to you, right? That that uh, alcohol is bad. Um, she has that talk with everybody, um, and and so he and he goes on to confess. He says he's 52 years old. This is some years ago, and he's never had a drop of alcohol." And what he said was, as people clapped in the audience, he said, I don't say this to be virtuous. I say it because there's something powerful about identity. 
and what it is to to stand for something when the world is confused about what it is you stand for and and I think that's what this this letter to the Ephesians um, a, a lot of a lot of that and it's in the scriptures as a whole but a lot of what it is to be um, a Christian what it is to be a child of God is to stand in this place in our identity and and declare this is who we are this is who I am for the Spirit of God lives within me and so therefore you know I'm going to live into this new life I'm going to put off my old self and and now I'm going to speak the truth right I'm not going to live a life of lies and we all say oh well, we should always be lying but our whole our whole culture is set up by by seeing what sort of falsehoods we can get away with in order to advance our careers or get a little bit more money back on our taxes or whatever you know how can we sort of stretch the truth a little bit how can we make ourselves appear greater than we are and and put down others um, in the process, right? Instead, we're, we're called to speak the truth in love. Um, and, and a lot of times this has been one of those manipulated passages like, I'm, we're just called to speak the truth in love. You're not really, you know, and, and then sort of go on to point all the, all the um, bad things about other people, right? I'm just speaking the truth in love. You shouldn't you shouldn't be acting this way. I'm just speaking the truth in love. Your character is not really that good. I'm just speaking. That's not how this. That's not how this um, verse is meant to be read, right? That's the same as as Jesus commenting uh, before you before you point out the speck in your brother's eyes, take out the log in your own li- in your own eye, right? Um, this is this is really just living a life that's that's. Um, that's putting aside falsehood and instead um, being genuine, being being honest, but but being gracious as well. Um, don't steal anymore, right? I mean, I mean these things that that maybe maybe um, maybe obvious, but they're still you need to be transformed, right? This is this is what what Paul's saying: the ways that you live. Um, in in your life before, those are the things you need to put behind. Be angry and yet do not sin, and this is a great one. Be angry and do not sin because anger is is a powerful emotion. Anger is a, an emotion that gets things done, right? You're angry. Jesus is often angry. He's angry at the Pharisees' treatment of the Sabbath, where they say, "Come back and heal that guy tomorrow um, instead of today," and Jesus says. This guy is suffering. This guy's in pain. This guy's been been in pain for for years and years and years. And you're saying come back tomorrow because it's today is the Sabbath. You've got everything distorted. You're worried about about these little rules and and neglecting the big rules, right? I mean, he gets angry. As he heals the man with the withered hand, and and he continues to heal on the Sabbath. The Sabbath is the day of rest. Why is this not the day that somebody should be resting? Somebody should be free from their 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 affliction, their ailment, right? He says he gets angry at other places um, with the Pharisees saying, "You you know you tithe down to your spices, but you're neglecting." widows you're neglecting the poor you're neglecting justice in the world and you know you should be doing both right i mean and so jesus gets angry but he doesn't sin right he doesn't he doesn't harbor it he doesn't inflict violence on people he doesn't you know he's just it's it's an it's an emotion that spurs us to action um, we should be angry at some of the things that we see in the world. We should be angry at some of the injustice that happens. We should feel our hearts 
gut-wrenching at times over, over abuse. Um, but that doesn't mean we, we're we called to sin. Indeed, we're called to do something different. We're called to stand in the gap and declare the love and grace of Christ while also addressing these, these types of things. So it's, it's interesting this passage of, of how we're called to enter into something new because we were this way, right? We were people who thought this way, but now we've been filled with the spirit of God. And so therefore you're new creations. And so therefore be transformed. And this is your new identity to, to um, leave behind bitterness, leave behind slander, leave behind malice, put those things away. Be kind and tender-hearted. We're called to forgive one another, and we live in a we live in a, a world where where forgiveness is, you know, by and large conditional at best. Right? I'll forgive you if you promise never to do X, Y, or Z. I'll forgive you if you do this. Forgiveness is it should just flow from us because we've been forgiven, and it's it's so hard in in a world where we're we're taught. Um, you know, to to expect fairness, to expect this, to expect that, and um, and it, it's just tough, right? To expect that, um, you know, and if people are mean to us, then we should be get to be mean back, or at the very least, we should just get to hold that resentment forever. Um, and instead. We're called to let go of bitterness, to let go of malice, to let go of slander, and to and to have forgiveness flow through us because we've been forgiven in Christ. This is an identity thing, right? It doesn't come, it doesn't come naturally. It's a something that when you try to explain it to people, they look at you weird anyway. They don't see it um, because because it's an old self that requires understanding that the bread of life has come down from heaven to feed us, to empower us, to dwell within us, to abide in our hearts and our souls in order to enable us to live in this new way, in this new pattern. And so therefore, be imitators of God. Therefore, be imitators of God. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us an offering and sacrifice to God offered himself as a fragrant offering to God on the cross, gave his life for us. And so therefore, this is how we too are to offer ourselves as a fragrant offering to God, pouring ourselves out as a living sacrifice, reflecting the grace and love and glory of God, putting aside those things that are not of God and instead taking on those things that are. And and in looking at it this way, this is then... Many of the things that are in the Bible, these sort of thou shalt nots, thou shalts, these things that are that seem like, you know, sort of wagging, getting your finger wagged at you, is is we're not called to do these because these are new laws. We're not called to do these because these will, will bring salvation. We've already been promised by Jesus, all who eat of this bread will live forever. Right? That's unconditional. We who come and respond to Jesus who eat of the bread of life have life. However, therefore, because we have this life, allow yourself to be transformed more into a godly person, to be more like an imitator of God, of Christ. Offer yourself as a fragrant offering to God through doing godly things, not because it saves you, not because it makes you virtuous, but because it's your identity of of God that lives in you, that works through you. And this is the invitation um, and the call that that Paul writes in Ephesians. Um, and And it's one that the church needs to begin taking really seriously, that indeed, um, because we are this way, because we've been made children of God, because the old 
has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Um, we are invited to live in a fresh and new and exciting way that declares to the world, here we are, standing for the love and grace and righteousness and justice of God, the mercy and compassion and glory of God. And there's nothing easy about this, right? There's nothing easy about this. There's nothing easy about um, standing over and against the world. Rather, we do it not because it's easy, but because it's who we are. Amen. How deep the Father's love for Let us pray the prayer our Savior Christ has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Gracious Lord and Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise for this day. We give you thanks and praise for sending your Son, Jesus, to be the bread of life that feeds us, that nourishes us, that draws us to you. We thank you, Holy Father, for leading us, for coming to us. for making us your children, for sending forth your spirit to bless, to inspire, to reflect your good and glorious will, to bring peace and unity into a broken world, to bring healing Come, Lord Jesus, 
Indeed, feed us. Feed us with your holy food, your holy body, and draw us deeper and deeper into your great love. Through your most perfect name we pray. Amen. May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. The blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you now and remain with you always. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Unless you of the flesh of the Son,